Oh snap. Welcome back to the channel, y'all. My name's Patrick. If you like true crime, go ahead and hit the follow button. Uh, I think this one's also going to be on YouTube, so hit the subscribe button on YouTube. And both places, do me a favor and hit the little thumbs up, y'all. Hit the thumbs up. Uh, on Rumble right now, we just went live. How many people did we have waiting? 200 people waiting. And we got 45 likes. Y'all, let's get 200 likes. Come on, everybody hit that little like button. I appreciate the love. I appreciate the support. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about the night America's most wanted killer couple were caught. O-M-G. Let's figure out what's going on here. I appreciate you guys. Like I said, make sure you just hit the follow button. Hit the, the like button. Hit the all the buttons. Every single button. Just hit it. Thanks for the Rumble Rants, too. Usually, I'd put it up, but we didn't get one yet. But when we do get a little Rumble Rant action, you know, we're going to put it on the screen. So uh, click that little dollar sign down at the bottom. Support the show directly if you want to. I appreciate it. You don't have to. But I do appreciate it, y'all. Thank you so much. All right. Here we go. I'm going to shrink myself down. And let's find out what happened. This was a high stakes moment when dozens of law enforcement vehicles descended on a remote property to apprehend Blaine and Susan Barksdale. The married couple was on the run. They escaped custody while being transported by van across the United States to face murder charges. Oh, damn. They tricked the guards, then overpowered them and got away. The U.S. Marshals video captures the arrest on a night vision camera. <laughs> Join us as we investigate this haunting case involving the Barksdales and examine the events that led up to this dramatic conclusion. The victim in this tragic story is Frank Bly, a 72-year-old retired Air Force veteran who served two tours in Vietnam as a helicopter mechanic. Frank Jesus. Bly and Susan Barksdale had been great friends for decades, but that friendship ultimately cost Frank his life. Holy hell. Frank, Susan, and Blaine all lived in Tucson, Arizona. For many years, Frank... Ah, uh, see, there's your problem. Uh, shout out to Stacy. Okay, fine. Here it is. Ah, Stacy, thank you for the two dollar Rumble Red. Are you ready to rumble? Thank you for the love, y'all. Shout out to Rumble. Put type a W in the chat because it's a win for free speech over here on Rumble. We can say that this was a killer couple who murdered someone. I don't have to say weird words like unalive. Damn. And I'm just kidding about Tucson. Kind of. Spoke fondly about Susan to his family members and recounted the good times they had together, birthdays and holidays and other special events. But when Sue struck up a romantic relationship with Blaine Barksdale, Frank started to notice unsettling changes in his friend. According to his brother Skip, Frank felt like something was off and he grew uneasy with the new dynamic. Described by friends and family as kind and generous, Frank was a lifelong bachelor with no known children. He was the oldest of three siblings and... Did they say no known children? How dare you? Oh my God. Julie, you're right about this. I know. I've been there. <laughs> ...maintained a close relationship with all of them. Every Sunday, Frank spoke by phone with his brother in Connecticut and his sister in Maine. On April 7, 2019, he chatted with his sister as usual. But by the time his brother called, there was no answer. That Sunday, Frank was spotted at a local cow pony bar, and it was the last time anyone other than his killers would see Frank alive. Oh, no. As time ticked by, Skip became increasingly worried about the whereabouts of his brother. He called Frank every day, but to no avail. Nine days later, on April the 16th, he reached out to Frank's friend and emergency contact, Susan Barksdale. But a man answered the phone and told Skip that he had a wrong number before hanging up abruptly. This strange call heightened Skip's suspicions even further. 
That day, he reported Frank missing to the Tucson Police Department. He asked them to visit his brother's house and conduct a wellness check, but mm -hmm. the information they provided was a huge shock. At around 4 a.m. that morning, the fire department had raced to Frank's residence, only to find the house being consumed by a roaring fire and an ensuing explosion. On Holy hell! The day of the fire, Frank's body was not found in the house, and one of his vehicles was missing from the garage. Oh, Initially, shit. this could have been considered a good sign. Perhaps Frank was somewhere safe and alive. But when Frank's Lincoln Continental was discovered abandoned on a road a few miles away, the evidence that police found inside led them to suspect foul play. It is oh, believed shit. that Frank's body was taken <clears throat> from the house in the trunk of the Lincoln. Frank had a collection of approximately 100 guns and a large amount of cash and other valuables. Law enforcement speculated this was likely the primary motive behind the crime. Five days after the fire, police interviewed Blake Barksdale's 31-year-old nephew. They arrested Brent Mallard on suspicion of arson, second-degree burglary, and a felony criminal charge for his suspected involvement in the crime. Showing remarkable compassion, Frank's brother would later say he felt sorry for the guy, that Brent got taken for a ride. He added that Brent's uncle had screwed him royally. He got caught in the middle of something. Skip well, believed damn. the nephew had no choice but to follow Blaine's commands or risk dire consequences. By May, police had identified 55-year-old Blaine and 58-year-old Susan Barksdale as suspects in Frank's disappearance and issued warrants for their arrest. But oh, snap. Here we go. Go get them. By the way, y'all, uh, 257 people watching. Everybody, do me a favor real quick. Just close the chat, hit the X, and hit the thumbs up button. Let's get over 100 likes. Everybody watching, hit the thumbs up button. Do it real fast for me. I appreciate the love, y'all. We're new to Rumble. Only been here like a month. Um, so we need to get uh, as much engagement on the videos as we can so that we keep growing this amazing family, y'all. Shout out to Rumble. If you guys are enjoying the video, give it a thumbs up. Let Rumble know. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. But before the pair could be taken into custody, the Barksdales fled to Arizona and then headed for New York State. It is believed the couple sold about a third of Frank's guns along the way to Damn. fund their escape. The oh, camper Lord. was discovered in an industrial park in Henrietta, New York, when it was flagged by a license plate reader. U.S. Marshals and the Monroe County Sheriff's Department arrested the couple on May the 24th. Henrietta is a suburb 12 miles from Rochester, New York, and 75 miles from the Canadian border. Police believe the Barksdales traveled there to connect with someone they knew from Blaine's gang connections. Perhaps they were intending to flee to Canada. But when they arrived, Blaine found out that his contact had died. For three months, the Barksdales oh, were held in upstate New York in the jail while they awaited extradition back to Arizona. They were wanted on charges of first-degree murder, first-degree burglary, arson of an occupied structure, theft of means of transportation, criminal damage, and prohibited possession. But their extradition didn't go smoothly. On August the 26th, they managed to escape in Blanding, Utah, while they were being transported back to Tucson <laughs> by a private company contracted to provide this service to law enforcement agencies. Security Transport Service. How the hell do you have a company that's made specifically to transport these people and they break out? Man, this is crazy as hell. I hope this place went out of business. <laughs> they got to be sued, right? Like, how the hell does that even happen? What? What the fuck? It's my new favorite sound effect. Can y'all even hear it? I don't know why. This microphone doesn't pick... It's not omnidirectional, so it doesn't pick up shit from behind. So, like, literally to make you guys hear that, I'd have to point the microphone at the computer and then point it back at me, which is ridiculous. Anyways, tangent, let's keep going. This is based in Topeka, Kansas. A third prisoner who had been picked up in Kansas City was also in the van with the Barksdales. My understanding is when uh, when they left the jail that morning uh, to leave uh, for Arizona, that they were in uh, a belly chains. And uh, right outside uh, uh, 
in Utah. Uh, the uh, the Barksdales complained that they have uh, that they had uh, intestinal issues, and they needed to go to the bathroom. And uh, when uh, they when they pulled over in the van. To That's what I'm going to have to do from now on. To uh, let them use the restroom and, and take care of their personal needs. That's when they, they, they overpowered them uh, and uh, forced them uh, into the, uh, into the uh, back of the van and uh, left the area. Uh, the third prisoner who was being transported to Tucson was very cooperative. He was wanted in, in Pima County for... Uh, uh, improper use of credit cards or you know, a violent crime. And he had a, uh, this individual had an opportunity to also escape, but he wanted nothing to do with this situation and uh, cooperating uh, with law enforcement. The Bark steals. Right? He was like, oh, hell no, I ain't trying to do this shit. Y'all go run, do whatever you want. I'm going to sit my ass right here. East of the guard seized to free themselves from the belly chains constraining them. They drove the van to a sparsely populated remote Arizona town in Apache County to pick up a friend's truck for the next leg of their getaway. The guards, a man and a woman, were not carrying weapons, but there was a handgun in the van's lockbox. The Barksdales didn't take it, perhaps unaware that it was there. They stole about $30 in cash that they found in wallets. The Barksdales did not physically injure the guard, but they did leave them locked in the van, abandoned in the desert, not knowing where they were. It had to be terrifying for them to not know how they would escape the metal box that now contained them. The guards escaped their predicament by kicking out one of the van's windows, but by that time the fugitives had a significant head start. The Barksdales were now driving a red 2004 GMC Sierra pickup truck heading to parts unknown. The chase was on, and a nationwide manhunt was launched. Oh, After the damn. guards reported the prisoners' escape, the Arizona Department of Transportation <laughs> began flashing alerts along the state highways on digital messaging boards to alert the public to be on the lookout for the escaped prisoners. Two weeks passed, but the Barksdales remained at large. Uh, we believe, based on tips, uh, uh, calls into the marshal service uh, from informants, from interviews, that the Barksdales were possibly uh, in the east of the Snowflake area. And east of Snowflake, Arizona, uh, several miles and going for probably 20 miles, are uh, a lot of people who live off the grid. Uh, some are, some are anti-government people, uh, some are good people, they just want to stay away and, and uh, lead their lives. Uh, we have a lot, How dare you? a lot of drug dealers in the area who are involved in uh, methamphetamine use and sales, and it is a very difficult a area uh, to do surveillance and for people to come forward. We spent uh, almost uh, two weeks, uh, uh, over 40 deputies, and also working with our partners uh, with Apache County, Navajo County, DPS, FBI, and Tucson PD working this case around the clock since their escape on the 26th. And, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we have not had any solid leads uh, where they might be. The desert region of Apache and Navajo counties that law enforcement believed was harboring the Barksdales is the backcountry of northeastern Arizona, a maze of dead-end roads featuring cattle and horse ranches interspersed with undeveloped land. The area also has family cabins, trailers, drug dens, and survivalist compounds. And in that vast rural expanse, the borrowed red pickup truck the Barksdales were driving had vanished without a trace. Cell phones and law enforcement radios didn't work reliably out there, which complicated the operation to recover the runaways. Law enforcement searched by land and air for any signs of the couple who were considered Damn. to be armed and dangerous. Authorities were concerned that they had made their way back to some weapons they may have stashed, the ones they had stolen from Frank Bly. They warned the public not to approach the Barksdales if they were spotted. <clears throat> Meanwhile, they conducted warrant sweeps and property searches and made arrests in their quest to track them down, according to U.S. Marshal David Gonzalez when he spoke to the media. Uh, and I want to stress, we, we were concentrating very heavily in the Snowflake area, uh, you know, in the Navajo County area and in, in into right. Apache County area because of the type of 
uh, uh, people that he associated with that lived in that area, uh, people that he had gang affiliations with, uh, and, uh, uh, it, and it was a pretty good gamble. It, it, it really was. But I must add that they could be anywhere in the U.S. Uh, so we uh, we were keeping our our, uh, our our eyes open. We don't want to put uh, blinders on to think that uh, that's the only place they could. They could have snuck off into uh, New Mexico. We don't believe they're uh, in um, in Mexico. Uh, but uh, running, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have forty or plus uh, deputy marshals and uh, and FBI's assisting and uh, Tucson PD tracking down hundreds and hundreds of leads and going back historically uh, that you normally do on, on these type of uh, investigations and other in uh, oh, investigative uh, efforts that we do on, on high-profile cases like this. By September the 9th, the marshal's patience was running thin. They intensified their efforts. Blaine was placed on their 15 most wanted list, and the reward for information leading to his capture went to $25,000. Another $10,000 was offered for Susan. In light of the Barksdale's escape, Damn. reporters asked Gonzalez why they weren't flown back instead and why a private security company was transporting them instead of law enforcement officers. It it's happens a lot in the United States uh, with sheriff's departments. What the fuck? Huh? It happens a lot? Oh, no. Uh, with budgets shrinking, they have uh, fugitives around the country that need to be extradited back home. And uh, instead of using uh, sworn police officers, a lot of, a lot of agencies will use private security companies uh, to pick up uh, prisoners and, and, and bring them back. Just two days after Blaine Barksdale made the U.S. Marshal's most wanted list, the agency caught a break. Based on information received from a tipster, the U.S. Marshals, assisted by the Navajo County Sheriff's Office, oh damn, that dude was trying to get that 25k, was tracked the couple down at a remote rural residence of a friend in Gila County. They were hiding out in Pumpkin Center. More than 50 law enforcement officials descended on the one-acre property, including members of the U.S. Marshal Service, the Department of Public Safety, and the Sheriff offices. Why did they have to bleep that out? of both Gila and Navajo counties. After the marshals ordered them out, the homeowners emerged first. Then Susan Barksdale exited the home shortly after, visibly tearful and distraught. She confirmed that her husband was inside, but for several minutes, Blaine refused to come out. It took oh a while, and although he initially complied with the officer's commands, his demeanor changed as he got bam, bam, closer bam, bam. to the police officers. Oh, a deputy shit. U.S. Marshal used a stun gun and multiple beanbag rounds on Blaine before he was handcuffed and taken from the scene. Gonzalez later with, recounted that as Blaine was... They hit him with beanbags? Oh, shit. ...being booked into jail, he turned to the troopers and bailiffs and warned, Be careful. It's dangerous out there. Back in Tucson, one of Frank's neighbors was relieved that the fugitives were in custody, but he also expressed regret that the life of their friend and community member had ended so violently and senselessly. Mm. Frank's brother, Skip, was left to wonder why all this happened. I'm happy that they're caught. Uh, I'm sad that, that they did this to him. Uh, I wish they, they didn't. Uh, um, it's a tragedy. I mean, he's a Vietnam vet. He served uh, Vietnam. He got on the Air Force Reserve. He served this country. I don't think I, I never, ever heard him once say anything bad about anybody. Even Sue. He really, he liked Sue and everything that, uh, what she did and everything. But, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, when she met Blaine, uh, she turned into the Black Widow. The COVID Whoa. pandemic slowed the court system down, so the Barksdales served three years before their case was resolved. With the evidence stacked against them, they made a plea bargain with prosecutors. Susan Barksdale pled guilty to one count of manslaughter in November of 2021, and Blaine pled guilty to one count of second-degree murder in December of that same year. 
Blaine received 22 years and Susan got huh? five with credit given to both of them for their time served. Brent Mallard, Blaine's nephew, pled guilty to arson charges for burning Bly's house to the ground in 2020. Oh, shit. His nephew burned the damn house? Too, he was sentenced to seven years of probation and ordered to complete a drug and alcohol treatment program. In a heartbreaking twist, it turns out that Frank Bly had given his close friend Susan a pivotal role in his after-death arrangements. His brother Skip spoke about the irony in his impact statement that was broadcast remotely to the courtroom. But Ooh. so she had, she was in charge going to be the executor of my brother's trust. Some reasons, uh, my brother had the trust, all the, the Bible, the information in his house, and Blaine and her stole it. And they went in somewhere, I mean, it was in one of the reports, and they went somewhere, and I guess they went through the thing, and they ended up burning the whole thing. Now, that was my brother's life, and his last wishes were up in flames. As a special term of the plea deal, Blaine was required to reveal the location of Frank Bly's remains. The information he provided led law enforcement to Frank's body being discovered deep in the Salt River Canyon on January 4th of 2022, where he had been lying since 2019. Frank had been thrown over a guardrail, a belt and a small knife Skip had described as belonging to his brother were found with the body. Holy hell. Blaine and Susan gave statements to the court during their sentencing hearing and... Man, they are some sick-looking people, too. Look at them. Oh, my God. ...apologized to Frank's family. Um, I'd like to address Mr. Bly. And, and honestly, tell you, you're right. You're right, sir, and, and I am sorry. I, I, I am not going to sit here trying to make any excuses for my actions. Um, I I don't know what happened. I honestly don't. It, it, it was a joke thing. It happened. You know what? I'm not, not going to make excuses. What I know is wrong. I am very, very sorry. I'm very sorry to you and your family. Um, it was a joke thing? What? No, can I just say, or do you going to change what happened? I, I wish I could. I truly wish I could. Um, I, I would also like to, to say I'm sorry to my family, my wife, her family. I, I don't know, Mr. Black, even... Bro, not a single person gives a shit about hearing you apologize to your family for your actions. Shut up. The only thing they should ever say is, I am terribly sorry for what I did. Nothing can ever change it. Now put me to death, right? Like, put me to sleep. Kill me. That's what you should say. That's all you should say. You should say, you should say I am guilty. I'm truly sorry for what I did. I deserve the death penalty. That's it. And then shut the hell up. Sue or not, you know, she, she was very good friends with her brother. And she, she's not responsible for this. This, this was my actions, my actions alone. She's a victim. She, she was just simply scared to turn me in because I, the, the drugs that turned me into somebody that I'm not. I, I'm very ashamed of that. I, I, you know, I um, I pray every day that, that God will give you the, the strength and the that to move on, start healing. So I know. Again, everybody, I'm, I'm sorry. I really am sorry. Like, this is what I do to know this. I've never heard anybody in my life. And I was a dear friend of mine for many years. So I'm sorry I didn't get help. 
I don't see a day in the future that I won't be afraid. We're not sorry. You decide to play your way inside of my love. So just, just the bird. So I just need to do with my belt. Thank you very much. Thanks. After the hearing, Susan sent a note from prison to her daughter, Jada, to explain her side of how this tragedy unfolded. No, oh, Frank God. stood up for me. He saw the bruises on my face and arms and told Blaine to keep his hands off me. They had words. There was never a time that Frank disrespected me. Always a gentleman, never anything more than just good friends. I think that's what started the whole thing. Both were mad, and Blaine was on drugs, and, well, you know. I want you to know how proud I am of you for telling the story for me. I don't think I could say this to anyone. I truly didn't have a choice. I was so scared to say anything to anyone for fear he would hurt you or anyone I love. Just a few thoughts. Love, Mom. Damn. But Skip Bly was not convinced of Susan's sincerity, and he spoke out about these doubts during her sentencing hearing. He just wrote friend. He trusted her with everything. And she took everything away from him, the way I look at it. She's the one that gave Blaine all the tools that he needed to rob him, mm -hmm. steal him blind, and... Yup, to know what to look for. ...do whatever they did. And it's, um, it just, um... I just, uh, of, of all, between the two of them, she's the one I have absolutely no value in at all. She's absolutely worthless in my book. And I just, uh, I just, there, there's nothing else to say. I mean, it's... Damn. She betrayed my brother, she betrayed our family, and she betrayed her own family. And it, um, and it, that's, that's all I got to say. Thank you, Mitchell. Frank grew up in Goshen, Connecticut, a quaint New England town of about 3,000 people. He moved to Arizona many years before he died to escape the cold weather. In death, he would eventually end up back in his hometown. After three agonizing years of not knowing where Frank's remains were, the family was finally able to bring the body home and lay him to rest on a cloudy, drizzly day in May of 2022. An honor guard attended the funeral to recognize Frank for his military service. The touching farewell song traditionally played at the graves of those who had served in the American Armed Forces was played on a bugle at the memorial service. Oh, man. Oh, that's crazy. They're both up there. Oh, my God. I would never. I don't know what. Y'all are just sad you got caught. And if you truly were sad, you wouldn't have, well, first off, tried to get away. And then second off, when you did get caught, you wouldn't have then busted out of the security van and ran then. You don't do that if you're sorry. If you're sorry, you want to pay the, 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 the price. You want to atone for what you did and you want to take some accountability so you running means you did not and i don't believe you y'all both suck go rot in prison and then burn in hell that's crazy as hell y'all it was kind of a short one i didn't realize how short that was um but i guess that means i can get a little bit of extra sleep tonight let's go how dare you because i don't know man sometimes we get these we get these cases and like immediately afterwards i'm just like Emotional damage. I'm gonna figure out a way to make this like actually work. I wonder. I'm gonna figure it out, y'all. Don't worry. I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna figure it out to where y'all can hear the the sound effects. But I'm out of here. Make sure you leave a like on the video. In fact, hold on. Let's do a quick. Let's do a quick check here. We got 263 people watching, and we got 68 likes, y'all. 272 watching and 68 likes. Do me a little favor real quick, y'all. Close the chat and hit the little thumbs up button. And then go leave a comment. Go leave a comment on the video, y'all. 
Leave a comment. Leave Caitlin, it's literally up like all the way. It's maxed out so you guys can hear it. But it's because the microphone is not omnidirectional. So this side, you can't hear anything. But this side, you can. So I have to point this side at the computer. Anyways, love you guys. Go leave a like. Go leave a comment. I appreciate it. Hit the follow button if you happen to be new here. I'll see you all on TikTok tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Love you guys. Have a good night.